So hi, everyone. My name is Milad, and uh, I'm a first-year fellow. Um, so my background is in statistics and machine learning, and at Columbia, I worked with Andrew Gelman. And my main research focus is on using hierarchical Bayesian models to analyze data from social, environmental, and health data. Um, I really think these models can be useful in many applications at the Earth Institute. So the goal of my talk today is to provide uh, a kind of introduction uh, of these models to you and how we can benefit from them in your own research. And then if you're interested, you can come to me afterwards and we can talk more. Um, so let's focus on the Bayesian part for the starters. Uh, so in any given application that you have, you have some observed data, D, and you have some unobserved parameters that you want to learn from that data. So Bayesian data analysis has three main steps. So the first step is that you encode your uncertainties in the parameters and in your data using probability distributions. So you put a prior distribution on your parameters based on previous studies in the field before observing the data, and you also model the interaction between the data and the parameters using the likelihood, which, is, which depends on the underlying scientific phenomenon that you're studying. After you specify these probability distributions, then you go on and use the observed data and fit the model to that data. And in the last step, you evaluate the fit of the model, uh, see how well it fits some of the aspects of your phenomenon. And if you need to make any changes, you can go back and make the changes. So in the hierarchical part, um, Again, in many problems, it is the case that you have many parameters that you want to estimate, and these parameters are often related with each other. So for example, in this case, you have the parameters theta 1 to, and so on that each of them produce uh, an observation. And you know that at a higher level, these parameters are related with each other. So in the Bayesian sense, we assume that they are coming from a same population, which is parameterized by alpha and beta at a higher level. So here you can see a two-level model, for example. So I'm going to give a more concrete example in a bit. But as you can see, you can have all sort of structures with different levels and how they are interacting with each other. OK, so let's look at this kind of a hypothetical simple example of an educational intervention. So assume that we have come up with a new coaching program. And we implement that program in 100 schools, each of which have 50 students. And for each student, we uh, record a pre-intervention test score before starting the coaching program. And after the coaching program has ended, we do another test and we record those scores as well. So for each student, we can have a difference in the score, post-intervention minus pre-intervention. And hopefully, these are positive, which means that students have improved. Uh, so here, for example, you can see the 100 schools. and uh, so the score differences are different in each school between different students. Some students have higher uh, score differences. For some students, it might be negative, which means that the coaching program didn't work. So we can assume that all these scores in each school are coming from a normal distribution. So if you plot the histogram of that, you'll get a bell-shaped curve. And then the ultimate question we would like to answer is how helpful this new coaching program is. Uh, so we can answer it in a couple of ways. So the first way that I call no pooling is that we estimate these improvements in each school totally separately and independently. So we look at school one, ignore schools two to 100, and we say, OK, so the, uh, the improvements are wise. And we have 50 students, so we just average those numbers, and that will be the improvement in school one. The same for school two until 100. Uh, so you can see by just ignoring other schools in estimating the improvement in each school, we are kind of ignoring relevant information that we can use because we are using the same coaching program in these different schools. So another extreme is to do a complete pooling and just consider all 5,000 students in 100 schools together and assume that the improvement in all 100 schools are similar and it is equal to the average over all these 5,000 schools. And in this case, we are ignoring differences, potential differences between the schools. For example, the resources each school had might have been different. The way that they implemented that coaching program might be slightly different. Uh, and by just doing this complete pooling, we're ignoring these differences. So now the hierarchical Bayesian models come into play. And uh, what they do is that they do what I call partial pooling. 
So they strike a trade-off between no pooling and complete pooling. And the way they work is that we have a two-level model. In level one, we model, same as before, the, school, the score differences in each school. So we assume that they are coming from a normal distribution with a mean which shows the average improvement in that school. And at a higher level, we assume that these uh, averages are themselves coming from a, a probability distribution. So what this does is that it tells us that we estimate these mean improvements separately, but at the same time, we assume that at a higher level, they are related with each other. So for example, if that bell normal distribution was a point, what it meant is that all these uh, mean uh, differences are going to be the same, which corresponds to uh, complete pooling. And if it was a flat distribution, then it meant that they are totally different, which was like no pooling at all. And by imposing that probability distribution, we are doing a trade-off between these no pooling and complete pooling. And the level that this information is uh, pulled together depends on the data. So we learn the amount of pooling from the data. So hierarchical Bayesian models are a natural way to estimate multiple parameters that are related, as I showed in this example. And they're naturally suited for uh, applications where you have this sort of hierarchical structure in the data. So for example, in health experiments, normally the case is that the units of interest are individuals, so the patients. You want to know whether a treatment worked on patients or not, but the randomization is done at a higher level. So for example, in clinics or physicians or geographical units. So then in those cases, these hierarchical Bayesian models are a natural fit because they allow you to fit these models in each in these randomization units separately, but at the same time, pool all this information together to strengthen your estimates. So for example, if in the population studies you want to estimate the number of babies born, again, this number could vary by the day of the week, by the month, hospital, etc. But then you expect all these parameters to be related with each other at a higher level. And by using a hierarchical model, you can uh, do that joint estimate. The same for uh, having geolog geological observations in different regions or if you are doing a meta-analysis of uh, different clinical trials. All these have sort of this hierarchical structure in them that can be used efficiently by hierarchical Bayesian models. So on the Bayesian side, uh, the Bayesian models allow you to uh, model and measure uncertainty with probability distributions. So you don't have to summarize all your results by a point, single point estimate, which could be just not so much informative. Instead, you can show your results by probability distributions, which are a very natural way to encode uncertainty about the parameters of your model. And uh, by using different priors, you can combine different sources of information. So for example, you can use uh, previous studies in the field to just as a prior information or um, if there are any like uh, constraints in your experiment, you can also encode those in terms of probability distributions. And it happens in many cases that average treatment effect alone is not very um, useful. So, uh, and it is important to know how the effect varies across the population. So for example, in social sciences, um, we know that many effects are contextually bound, and if you want to have a, an effective policy making, you need to know how these effects change in different situations so that uh, you know how different individuals would uh, be affected by a certain policy under different uh, contexts. And on a statistical note, um, by just having these sort of multi-level models, you can aggregate different experiments, different uh, randomization units, and all that, and gain statistical power by just combining all uh, these together. So how can you use a hierarchical Bayesian model in the problem on a step-by-step -step basis? So you have an observed data, you have an observed parameters, and uh, First, you encode your domain knowledge about the parameters by a prior distribution. Then using the underlying scientific phenomenon that you're modeling, you uh, specify how the data that you observe change with those parameters that you modeled. And then you have the data and you have to fit that model. 
So uh, in Colombia, actually, uh, a probabilistic software called STAN has been uh, being uh, built in the past few years, which is a very nice program. You can access it through R, MATLAB, Python, any other software language that you use. And it provides a very simple coding experience and very fast inference. So it is built for non-experts in the Bayesian, for example, the social scientists, to be able to use it and encode uh, and model what they have in a very easy way. So for example, the specification of a model as simple as just saying that mu is coming from normal distribution, sigma is Cauchy, y is normal, and those sort of um, expressions. And then using STAN, you can fit your model and then go and check how it fits your uh, data. And if there are any need, uh, you can revise the model. Um, but the, you can also talk to a Bayesian, which is where I come in. And uh, as I said, if you think that you can benefit from these sort of hierarchical models in your own research, um, I'd be happy to talk to you. And so here's my email, and if you want to contact me. Thanks. So now we've got plenty of time. We've got a reasonable amount of time for questions for the new speakers, and if you come up with something for the previous speakers. Can I ask a question? Hmm? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so my question was about, um, am I supposed to get there? Sorry. No, we're doing first half and second My question was about, um, so it's really interesting study. Um, when you make your decisions about like, whether or not you're going to change cropping decision, cropping practice, have you assumed 100% that there's 100% use of irrigation? Or have you factored in the fact that, you know, very real scenario that particularly in like the larger areas where you've seen the, where you would might be abiding and changing behavior but in, in your like reduction stuff where actually it's not necessary? Yeah, I haven't uh, explicitly incorporated irrigation into it yet. Okay. And, uh, I just look at what the actual evapotranspiration of the crop is and whether or not that water demand is met by precipitation or irrigation. I don't distinguish between that right now, but that's a really important question because if you're replacing one crop with another and the replacing crop has an overall smaller water footprint, but the irrigation water demand is higher, then you probably don't want to do that replacement. So that's kind of the next step, but yeah. Thanks. Yeah, my question goes to Davies. The first one is, in terms of the crop redistribution, I try to imagine, for example, in Africa, where more than 300,000 farmers are low income, constrained in very small spaces, less than an acre. And then they do cash crop and just some small space for like vegetables for subsistence. How do they uptake this redistribution model to start doing ground nuts and other things when they need to survive? And then the second question is in terms of policies, you've talked about definitely there's need to increase food production because of rising populations. But that yet you find in a country like the US, 40% of produced food is actually wasted and which consumes about 25% of the total water consumption in the US, amounting to about $162 billion. That's according to uh, an NRDC report that came out last month. So in terms of policies, should, should we continue like globally pushing for intensifying food production or minimizing food wastage? Thank you. Yeah, I think um, to answer your first question, I think um, to realize benefits both at the local level and at larger scales, I think it ultimately comes down to an economic solution. So I'm starting a case study in India looking at, um, they have a public distribution system where, there where the government pays a guaranteed minimum price for rice to um, smallholder farmers and then redistributes that rice for free to um, low-income households. So I'm looking at the potential to incorporate um, more climate resilient, more nutritious cereals into that same type of program um, to 
not only see, incre see uh, benefits for the farmers, depending on how those crops are priced by the government, um, but also nationally um, in terms of food security. So I don't think there's a straightforward answer in, um, say, getting a smallholder farmer in Africa to start planting a different crop, but I think ultimately it comes down to how the crop is priced um, and whether or not the knowledge is locally available for somebody to produce that. Um, and then to answer your second question, um, I think, well, there's, um, the global food system is becoming increasingly interconnected. So countries are becoming much more exposed to um, disturbances that occur beyond their boundaries and are out of their control. So like the food crisis in 2008 um, left a lot of countries vulnerable to um, food in terms of food security. So I think countries should um, focus their efforts on kind of reducing reliance on trade and to a certain extent and trying to increase uh, food self-sufficiency within the country. So, thanks for your questions. Can I just add a little just wait, but you said you, the top part of the Sahel seemed often to have the most benefit, right? I mean, it had the darkest colors in just about everything. And it seems to imply that they're really growing the wrong crops. Is that, is that a logical conclusion or not? Um, well, there's, my study is very limited in the number of criteria that I consider, and there's lots of things that you need to think about in terms of additional nutrition and substitutability, things like that, um, cultural preferences. So given the criteria that I used, there was a large replacement that occurred, um, and most of that was due to um, protein. Uh -huh. um, the crops that were planted there had, the crops that ended up being planted there in the replacement had higher protein values. Um, but with that said, that uh, the type of this type of multi-dimensional approach needs to be thought of uh, a bit more locally if you actually want to incorporate that. So, like I'm doing in India, and it mm -hmm. takes into account um, lots of local factors that can affect whether or not we should actually have that happen. I have the microphone. I don't know if anybody else had a question. Uh, Professor Mutter's question kind of spoke to the question I had for you. Um, so uh, you kind of answered it, but I'll throw it out or anyway. I was curious as to the extent to which you considered uh, market flows and trading uh, current historical trade trends in considering the propensity for certain areas to accommodate different crops. So if, if they had markets that would take this surplus of X crop that they produce instead of the crop that they're producing now. Um, and that was, the, the other question I had was for the person who was studying in Bangladesh. I'm curious as to whether or not, if you could share some of the insights you've gotten from uh, measuring heat waves in other areas, um, particularly looking at uh, urban heat islands and whether or not how you incorporated this kind of literature into your current studies and models? Um, so my expertise is not in economics at all and certainly if you change the supply of a crop that's going to have impacts on prices and you have to think about where that would potentially be traded to, where it would be sold, where it would be consumed. Um, so that's something that my analysis does not take into account. I just look at kind of current economic values, um, but those would certainly be affected if you know, change um, crop distributions and overall production. Um, so that's where pricing plays an important role, and that's not in my wheelhouse, but thanks. Um, regarding the, uh, the heat wave question, um, so yeah, the urban, urban heat island is substantial. Um, I haven't accounted for it, so I've, in, in my study, basically due to, because of limitations with the amount of data we had available, um, the mortality data, which was only five years or so, um, 
we've had to look at an aggregated heatwave definition for the country. So I would fully expect that to be weighted towards cities because, uh, well, towards DACA basically, because it's, uh, it's low-lying, therefore it's hotter, it's, um, and it's a massive, dense uh, concrete jungle. So it's going to be the hottest, but we haven't actually estimated it. And so definitely, uh, well, we have plans to, to, to try and understand a little bit more the spatial variability of heat in the country. When it comes to uh, functioning within, a, within an early warning system, I don't think that um, it's going to change much because you're going to be targeting those kinds of interventions towards a dense population anyway, so you're going to be focusing them on DACA, at least in the first instance. So the types of interventions you would do would be very similar. Um, it would just help to have a, a better understanding of, of the spatial variation of the, of the hazard. But I think uh, the vulnerability is going to be focused uh, in parts of DACA. So I think we can, I, I think there's a lot more work to be done, but I, I, I'm quite cautious when I'm speaking particularly to stakeholders about this, that the people realize that there's a hell of a lot of stuff that can be done on the basis of almost no new climate information, actually. And then we can add to that as we get better data. Yeah, that sometimes um, it is useful to have the uh, location of the death, but if a person collapses and is taken to hospital, the death certificate will typically read the location of death as the hospital. And it won't, they won't necessarily include a description of where the person collapsed. Well, I mean, I guess it depends how, how spatially, how, how far you're going to drill down in terms of your yeah. uh, intervention method, me um, methods. So absolutely right, you wouldn't want to say that it was the conditions in the hospital where that person actually died that led to their particular case of heat stroke or heat-related illness. But uh, when it comes to uh, trying to, you know, it's that balance between fidelity and simplicity I was trying, and forecastability, rather, that I was trying to uh, yeah. strike in terms of coming up with a definition. Yeah. This happens in uh, natural disasters, I know, that if somebody's injured and goes to hospital, the location of the death is the hospital. Mm -hmm. And they don't even... And you might get the person's address, you know, home address, but you don't know that they passed out there. They may have been somewhere else. I have a follow-up question on, on Bangladesh. Um, you mentioned the importance of institutions, and maybe you mentioned in your talk, but there is already a flood warning system and there is a cyclone warning system in Bangladesh. I was wondering whether you could build on, on these existing systems, for instance, using SMS to, uh, to distribute the, the, the warnings. Yes, in my, my work with the Red Cross Climate Centre, they, they have this, um, well, they're not the only ones who are doing this, but there's increasing interest in the forecast-based financing system, which they are doing in Bangladesh for flooding. So uh, they have some of those networks there, and uh, you know, a lot of lessons learned through that. So. Um, Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think, so one, one of the most important things in a heat early warning system, or any early warning system, is a communication strategy. Particularly with heat, where a lot of the deaths are avoidable through, you know, through some quite simple measures. So public communication strategies are, are pretty important. Uh, and they're not going to be the same as they would be, you know, in, in Europe or America, because communication networks are different. But people do have mobile phones, so SMS, you're right. It's like all right, quick one. Thank you all for interesting presentations. I'm going to keep piling it on here to Hannah. Um, so you said you only had five years of mortality data. And so I wonder whether you don't, because I was surprised that humidity didn't come up as an important factor. You know, you always hear about heat index combining temperature and humidity. And is it possible that there have been some really large death events that are just not in your database that were associated with high heats and high humidity? And I understand because of the monsoonal system there, that's going to be sort of a rare event because your high heats are often associated with drier air. Um, but if, if that's the case, could you team up with Milad and then you know, estimate um, mortality conditional on heat and humidity worldwide and you, know, you could pool for different regions to account for you know, s sort of uh, maybe cultural differences or you know, I don't know. Do you know what I'm saying? Because there are places where you have more than five years of mortality data, right? I mean, there's, yeah, there's many places where you have more than five years of mortality data, for sure. Um, I love the idea of the second point. I think we'd have to figure it out how shall the details. Um, 
I don't know what the regional predictors would be, so that's, yeah. but. I mean, yeah, I think the key, well, the key part about that is getting access to that data. So uh, mortality data, it's human you know, related data, it's normally very, very protected. And data tends to be a, a major problem working particularly in developing countries because it's, um, it's uh, <coughs> something that's owned locally and it can be difficult to access. If you're just a, a researcher from abroad who wants to do a study, you know, uh, it's not that easy. So that would be the main obstacle, but I think it would be a great idea. The humidity point, uh, we, humidity was one of uh, the, we tested a range of different indicators, including heat index. And actually we found that there was very similar predictability gained by hot and humid days and nights, as there was by dry days and nights. Um, and we've advised to go for the dry days and nights over the humid days and nights, because the data that we used for humidity was gridded reanalysis data, not at the surface. So, and it's, I mean, it's to do with the simplicity for BMD, for the Bangladesh Met Department in terms of actually implementing this, but they had very similar predictors. It does get hot and humid in Bangladesh. Um, and those days are probably also important. So we've been asked to get out of here at exactly 4.30, and it's exactly 4.30. So I'd like to thank all of our terrific speakers for another terrific symposium. Uh, I'd also like to thank the organizers of the symposium and all of you who came and listened and asked questions. Um, so thank you all very much. Thank you, speakers. Thank you.